Philippians and chapter number 4. Philippians and chapter number 4. Doesn't seem possible, but we are sojourning very quickly through this uh, marvelous letter. And uh, I have enjoyed it. I hope it's been good for you as we've looked at how the gospel binds us together as a people. Even in the midst of suffering and trial and tragedy. Uh, we have looked at uh, how the gospel affects the community. And really, from beginning to end... This marvelous little letter has been about our purpose and hope in life, which is and always will be to glory in Christ Jesus. I hope that if you've gotten nothing out of this series, you've gotten that one thing this morning, that our hope in life, my hope in life, your only hope in life, all the very reason for existence, the purpose for existence this morning is only to glory in Christ Jesus. What a marvelous thought. No matter what else happens in life, I was created to celebrate Jesus, to glory in him, to magnify him. There's nothing good or great in any one of us this morning. There was nothing good or great in the Apostle Paul. There was nothing good or great in the Philippian church, even though they were a good church, except what was good and great in Christ Jesus. That is, they were created, as you and I are, for the magnification of Jesus Christ and Him alone. Such an admonition is easy when life is easy, is it not? We think about celebrating Jesus. We think about glorying in Jesus. We think about magnifying Christ and how easy that is when life doesn't have pitfalls along the way. When life is easy, when there's plenty of money in the bank account, when our kids are getting baptized, when our kids are, being, are, are acting the way they're supposed to and being moral, when, uh, when, when life seems to be all as it's supposed to be, that's when it's easy to glory in Christ Jesus. But life is not always easy, and I, I don't even have to tell you that this morning. As soon as I said, when life is easy, most of you thought to yourselves, yeah, when will that be? Have you ever caught yourself just thinking, man, I can't wait a couple years from now. Things are going to be different, right? It's going to be simpler. My kids are going to be off to college, or my kids are going to be in the kindergarten, and I'm going to have a little more free time, or whatever it is. We, we kind of always, as a people, want to look toward the future and think sooner or later, life is going to be simpler. And yet the reality is that as we get older, as our kids get older, as time goes by, we find that that's quite the opposite of how life works. It only gets more and more messy. Life gets more and more difficult each and every stage along the way. Life, in simple terms, is just messy business from time to time. Can I get an amen this morning? Life is just messy business from time to time. Things don't always go the way that we plan. Sometimes you show up and look for leaks in the church and you don't find them until Sunday school begins and somebody tells you, hey, I found one. Things don't always go the way that we plan them. Life can be messy. Sometimes things happen that are beyond our control. Sometimes we get up and we have a plan for how the day is going to go. And all of a sudden that plan is rocked. Sometimes our ship, as it were, is torn a piece into pieces asunder. Living in a fallen world, we are prone to experience some of the messiness of life. Let me even speak a little more frankly than that. Living in a fallen world, we are prone to experience pain and suffering. Just this morning, a family in our church in need of our prayers awoke to something they weren't expecting, awoke to a father unresponsive. Sometimes living in this fallen creation where sin has cataclysmically uh, disrupted the universe as God created it, none of us are immune. Sometimes living in this fallen world, life just gets really messy along the way. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter, this beautiful letter, one of the most beautiful and articulate letters in all of the New Testament, in, all, in, in one of the messiest situations of life. As he sat in chains in a Roman jail cell, awaiting the sins of his life, would he be freed, would he be spared, would he be put to death, and how would he be put to death? As he awaits the answer to those questions, he is in the messiness of life, and yet he writes one of the most beautiful and eloquent letters in all of the New Testament. I think that fact in itself is a testimony to how the Christian is supposed to respond to tragedy, trial, and messiness, as it were, in grace. 
Paul knew the Philippians would not be spared from the trials. Even though they were not in the jail cell with him in that moment suffering, he knew that they had already and would forevermore experience more trials, more pain, more suffering because of their commitment to Jesus Christ. By way of delivery, he knew that you and I, thousands of years later, would never be immune to trials. Jesus said that the rain would fall on the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. Sometimes that rain is like a sickness, a cancer along the way. Sometimes it's abandonment, the loss of friends, the loss of a relationship. In some places around the globe this morning, that messiness of life is actual persecution as men and women suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Today, this morning, this evening, and in other places around the globe, there are men and women who meet in secret paying the ultimate price if they would be found out because of the cause of Jesus Christ. Life is messy business. It's easy to celebrate Jesus. It's easy to magnify Jesus. It's easy to glory in Jesus. It is easy to say that we hope in Christ when life is easy, when we are far removed from the trial, from the tragedy in any of its various forms. But the character, our character, is not measured. The character of our faith is not found in our ability to glory in Christ when life is easy. Instead, quite the contrary, the content of our faith will be measured in our response to suffering. And so what Paul does here in Philippians is he picks up the pen to finish his thoughts about how the Christian responds to the messiness of life. I want to look at verses 4 down to verse number 9. And I had originally planned on covering all of this in one setting, but I've decided this morning I'm going to divide it into two parts. But listen to the words of Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, all the way down to verse number 9. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. He says, And again I will say, Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which passes, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Verse number 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything of excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about or upon these things. What you have learned and received, he says, and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. In order to understand the apostle's words, we have to take a step back for a moment this morning, and we have to understand the apostle's view of the human condition. And really, not just the apostle's view of the human condition, but the Bible's view of the human condition. That is that the Bible divides man into three distinct parts. Sometimes only two, joining two of them together. But for the most part, the Bible divides man into three parts. And that is, it speaks of his soul, his mind, and his body. Great ink over the years has been spilt in trying to show the distinctiveness of humankind over the animal kingdom, the animal world as it were in this way. That man is divisible into these three parts can illustrate the very trinity itself, illustrate plurality in unity. When God created man, he said that he was going to create man distinctly different than he created the rest of the world. That is, that he would create man in his own image. One of the things that he gave to us or made us distinct from the animal world was these divisible parts, the mind, the body, and the soul. And while a great deal could be said about that today, I'm not going to digress. I only want to point that out in order for you to understand that suffering in the human condition must be viewed in all three parts. That is, that there are suffering in the mind, suffering in the soul, and suffering in the body. Paul, as he wrote to the Philippians, was unconcerned with the suffering of the soul. And the reason why was because the soul was secure in Christ Jesus, in the work of Christ. 
He had already stated in this letter his firm conviction that what God had begun in them, he would see under its completion. Paul believed that the soul of the Philippians was untouchable. It was, un, uh, it was un, uh, unapproachable by the enemy. That nothing and nobody could do anything about their soul's condition because of the work of Jesus Christ. But just as salvation would touch every part of the human condition, thus we believe in the physical resurrection while other religions do not, so too does suffering. Suffering would touch not only the soul, but the mind and the body along the way. And so what the apostle does here when he comes to Philippians 4 is he addresses how those two facets of the human condition are to be affected by suffering and how we are to respond with them. In other words, Philippians 4, at least verses 4 through 9, are the response of the body and the mind to suffering. What a great message. What a great thought for us to think on. Because if you're not going through suffering, if you're not going through a trial this morning, listen, at some point you will be. It's been said that you're either coming out of suffering, headed into suffering, or you're in suffering. In fact, if those of you who remember right, there's three rings in marriage. Do you remember what they are? There is the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffering. Everybody goes through these things from time to time. You're either headed into it, coming out of it, or living through it in that moment. And so we must understand how does the body and the mind supposed to respond in the Christian worldview to suffering. Well, first of all, Paul will address how we suffer or how we address suffering in our bodies. Verse number four. He writes, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. The term rejoice, it speaks of an action spawned in joy. That is, that it is a conscious act or a response to what is felt deep down inside. Naturally, then we wonder, how can one rejoice in suffering? How can one have a conscious decision to joy and to joy again, as it were, in the midst of suffering? How can he draw from something that is inside? Paul is not speaking, to be clear this morning, about simply making lemonade out of lemons. He's not speaking about gritting your teeth and just bearing through something. He's actually speaking about celebration, to joy and to joy again. He says that in our bodies, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trial, we are to joy and joy again. And again I say, joy and joy again. Well, in that little word joy, we find the answer to our question. You see, joy is not a tangible piece of the human condition that you can put your finger on this morning. Instead, joy is something deep down inside of you. You see, outside forces can silence my laughter today. They can put duct tape over our mouth and they can remove our speech. But no one and nothing can touch your joy because it's not tangible, it's not physical. Joy is born out of a deep well inside the soul of a person. Like a bucket that is being drawn from a cistern, joy is born out of a personhood. For that reason then, the Christian must understand that our joy is rooted in the soul's satisfaction or the soul's condition in Christ Jesus. In other words, this morning, if I'm not satisfied in Christ, then I'm not satisfied. I'm not full of joy. But on the other hand, if I am satisfied in Christ, then He is my joy. He is the cistern, as it were, that I will draw from. Nobody and nothing can ever touch that. No amount of persecution in all the world could touch the Philippians' joy in this moment. Their joy was rooted in the work of Jesus Christ. And this was what Paul had spent great length discussing when he had spoken about his own personal experience with Christ Jesus. He said that I thought I had been working my way toward God. But what I found out was that all the things I thought had advanced me toward God had actually been a loss. They had been a, a, a reflection of a debit on my account. And he says, at the end of that, all I want to do is that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. The source of joy for the apostle would be his relationship, his intimacy, his knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ. The same was true for the Philippian church. 
their source of joy was rooted in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he writes to them in verse number four, rejoice, listen, in the Lord. Rejoice, joy and joy again in the Lord. Christ Jesus, Philippians, is your source of joy this morning. Church, Cornerstone Baptist Church, Jesus Christ must be our source of joy. Nothing else and nobody else. In fact, maybe that's what the real problem in our society is. Too many times when we think about joy, what happens is we try to draw from the wrong well. We want our joy to come from the wrong things like relationships or possessions or social status, jobs, occupations, etc. along the way. We try to draw from those things as though they would satisfy the soul's longing. But the Christian source of joy is Jesus Christ. Anything else is within the grasp of the world. The world can take away my job. The world can take away my possessions. The world can take away all of those other things, even my social status and my relationships. But the world cannot take away Christ Jesus in me. The world cannot touch my joy, but if the Christian lives as though the source of joy, the well from which he draws, is something other than Jesus Christ, we ought not be surprised that there are so few joyful believers. Have you ever walked into church? I know you haven't here, but have you ever walked into church and thought, man, I wish these people would just get a little excited? I wish these people would just smile from time to time? It's been said before that too many churches begin at 11 o'clock sharp and finish at noon dull, right? Too many believers walk around as though there's no source of joy. And the reason why is they are drawing from the wrong cistern. They are drawing from the wrong well. Paul told these believers in Philippi and by, by extension to us here in Sedalia, Missouri today, he tells us that we are to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. Our source of joy is Christ. Anything else is in the world's grasp. But Jesus Christ and his work on our behalf, our relationship with him cannot touch, cannot be touched by the world. What persecution could do was affect how the Philippians rejoiced, their response to joy. Trials, they challenge us to stop acting on our joy. They tempt us to not draw from the well, to not reach down and to grab a little bit that's in there. But Paul's admonition to the Philippians in this moment was not to allow that to happen. Make an intentional effort, as it were. Make an intentional decision, a conscious decision to draw from the well, to dig deep in the midst of the trial and draw from the well of joy, Jesus Christ, and make an intentional effort to act to rejoice and rejoice again. I don't know about you, but I've been there before. Where life just seemed to get really, really messy. And all of a sudden, you had to make an intentional effort to draw from the well. To rejoice in the Lord and rejoice again. Even when you didn't feel like it was, it was worth rejoicing over. Even when you didn't feel like it was worth celebrating over. And yet, when you began to celebrate Christ, when I began to rejoice in Him, when I began to think on what I had in Him, suddenly my heart would be transformed, changed, trans- something transpired in that moment, and all the problems of the world would begin to fa- simply fade into the distance. The first response of the body in suffering for the Christian was to rejoice. Intentionally act or draw from the well of Jesus Christ and to celebrate Him. Then the apostle writes in verse number 5, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. On three, I want everybody to say that little word reasonableness together. One, two, three. Reasonableness. The reason I wanted you to say it together is because it is something that is so often absent from the believer. Reasonableness is not even difficult to define. It may be difficult to say, but it is not difficult to define. It is difficult to find it, however, in our world. In a world filled with passion, often misplaced, reasonableness sticks out like a sore thumb. Reasonableness is characterized in thoughtfulness, as it were. Patience, logical thinking, calmness, stillness, right? That's what reasonableness is. 
It would be easiest to define what reasonableness is by showing you the opposite. How do we do that? Next Sunday, we're going to take a field trip to a local sporting event. You will not see anything reasonable there. If you don't believe me, come to a five- and six-year-old soccer game with the pastor, right? When his son falls over, he's screaming, get up! You're not hurt. Stop your crying, you big baby, right? Nobody else is picking on the pastor's son, but he is. That's the opposite of reasonableness. But the believer, Paul says, is we are to live differently. We're to live with a certain sense of calmness. To live with a certain sense of sensibility. To live patiently. To live thoughtfully. The Christian, in simple terms, is not supposed to fly off the handle. We're supposed to be calm and assured. We're supposed to respond to difficulty with assurance, conviction, and calmness. Paul will even go on to define what reasonableness is for us in verse number 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything. We aren't to pace the halls of life, as it were, as if there is no order, as though the world were in chaos. We are to simply be calm, not be anxious about anything. We know how the world is not in chaos, as it may seem, because today the believer believes in the sovereignty of God. God is in control. In the midst of all the chaos, the believer doesn't get anxious, doesn't worry, doesn't get nervous about anything, Paul says, because he is trusting in the care of God himself. But in everything, Paul writes, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The world responds to chaos we see all the time with worldly wisdom. The world tries to resolve the world's problems with immediate action. Have you ever noticed how there's an urgency about the world? You always have to do something immediately. Duck Dynasty has taken off the airwaves and we have to immediately contact A&E. The last man standing is taking off the airwaves and we have to immediately respond to ABC. We cannot allow for a little bit of time to pass over. Instead, we are looking for immediate responses, right? And we oftentimes want to respond in a wisdom, worldly wisdom type of way. How do we resolve these things? Well, we bring in the best scientists, we bring in the best, best psychologists, we bring in the, the experts, and we allow them to tell us what the problem is. But the Christian's response is to be different. He's not to be anxious about anything because he trusts in the sovereignty of God. He trusts in God's care for him. And instead of immediately responding, the Christian's response is to call upon a higher partner. But in everything, Paul says, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known unto God. Uh, contrary to the world seeking an expert, the Christian seeks a higher partner. He lets his request be known unto God. Instead of diving him into immediate action, the Christian is supposed to, Paul says, still himself before the Lord and ask for help. In fact, Paul uses two words here to describe these requests. The word prayer and the word supplication. The word prayer speaks about a request to divinity. In other words, a request made to a higher authority. The word supplication is more than a request. It speaks of begging in humility. So Paul says that we are to let God know about our needs. We are to let God know about the messiness of life with a prayer, a simple asking for him to help, and also with a supplication, a begging, an entreatment in humility. God, I am desperate for you. Would you please, please respond? The Christian's response to trial, Paul is saying in this moment, is to humbly beg and petition before God. While the world seeks wisdom of man and to respond immediately and not to allow any time to calm things down, the Christian is to be calm and beg the Lord for a response and for wisdom. One other significant word that's there is that word thanksgiving. Paul says we are to make our prayers and our supplication with thanksgiving. That word thanksgiving means to respond to something that has been given. In other words, we're to respond to something that we have received. 
In other words, the church was to offer up its prayers, offer up its request, offer up its begging before God humbly with thanksgiving. In other words, they were to do it in response to what they have already received. Now, I want you to stop for a moment and think about this. Paul is in the midst of a Roman prison. The Philippians are going through great trial and persecution. They are longing for word from the apostle about how God has freed them. Yet in this moment, they have received nothing. The Romans have not said what they're going to do with the apostle. The Philippians have not, their gift has not freed him. And in fact, the apostle has said that he didn't want that to be the case. Nothing has happened. Nothing has transpired except the Philippians have sent word to the apostle that they support him and are with him. And yet in this moment, the apostle says, we are now to pray and to beg of God as though we have already received with thanksgiving. How could he say that? Well, the answer is that the church had a firm conviction. The apostle had a firm conviction of a guaranteed receipt. In other words, he was praying with a conviction that God would answer. You would pray with a conviction that you would receive. That's what it means to pray with thanksgiving. God, I need you to move in this situation. God, I need your help. God, I am dependent upon you. But you pray out of a heart that knows you will receive one way or another. You will receive from the Lord. In fact, you have already received in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean, church, this morning that we have a firm conviction that we will get everything that we ask for. doesn't mean that we have a firm conviction that we will get everything that we have requested because James says sometimes we ask wrongly. But what we do is we pray as one who knows that God will hear our prayers and will give us exactly what I need when I need it. Sometimes that's difficult. But that, Paul says, is the Christian response to suffering. There is the contrast. The world is unreasonable. The world is brash. The world has a sense of chaos. The world has a sense of immediacy. He has to always respond to everything. We've got to protest everything. Therefore, we've lost our right to protest anything at all. We have to immediately respond to all things. Never let anything pass by. The Christian, Paul says is to be totally different, to be different than all of those things. The Christian is to be reasonable, he's to be methodical, he's to seek the guidance of Christ, and he is to trust that the Lord he petitions will answer and give him what he needs. Now before I move on to a great promise, I want to show you one piece that is often missed. At the end of verse number 5, When he had told them, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, he then writes, the Lord is at hand. Now growing up, when my pastor would preach this passage, I always assumed that that meant that if I was unreasonable, God would see it and punish me. In other words, I should govern my behavior, I should change my behavior on the perception that God was right here in the room with me. In fact, that's how we get our children to obey, isn't it? We say, you know, God is watching, right? And if that doesn't work, Dad is watching, right? We try to change our behavior. We will even tell, as a student minister, I would tell students, I want you to imagine that God is in the room watching what you're doing. He's watching what's transpiring. That's how I read these verses. That's how my pastor preached them. That I should be reasonable because God is watching. But actually, it's written quite the opposite. He says, the Lord is at hand. Then he tells them to petition him, to speak to him, to ask of him, to pray, to offer supplication in thanksgiving. In other words, the apostle is saying, God is right here with us. That's why we pray. That's why we petition. This morning, we petition a God, not who is off in a distance, but a God who is right here in the trenches with us. A God who is right here at hand. A Lord who is accessible and available to us. Thus Paul says, 
That is why you should be reasonable. That is why you should be methodical. That is why you should be logical, thoughtful, patient, calm. Because the Lord is available. He is right here at your fingertips. He is accessible in this moment. You need not the wisdom of man because you've got the great wisdom from on high. You've got the God of heaven and earth, creator and sustainer of all things. God is here with us. Somebody more should have agreed with me. He concludes in verse number 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, listen, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This morning I want you to know there are a great many things that I cannot control in this world. There are a great many things you cannot control. Some of them good, some of them not as good. There are things in the world that you and I cannot control, such as trials and tribulation. But Paul is saying that we can control our response to them. Namely, that instead of acting with a sense of immediacy, instead of acting impatiently, instead of pacing the world, the floor, as it were, we could stop in this moment and celebrate Christ. Be reasonable, thoughtful, and to take our burdens directly to the God who is with us. But controlling our body is not always an easy task. Certainly, there has a mental part associated with it. There's a mental aspect to controlling our bodies. And so Paul writes that God will give us the right mental state to be able to be reasonable. God will give us the right mental state to take our petitions, to take our supplications, to take our burdens to him. God will give us the right mental state to be reasonable among men. How does he do that? He writes, the peace of God, literally God's peace. God owns this peace. It's his peace. It's a divine peace, a supernatural peace, an undefinable, unexplainable peace. John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus told his followers, uh, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Peace, Jesus says, I give to you. And it's my peace. It's God's peace. God's peace is unexplainable. It's not the product of calm circumstances or having everything in the world. Instead, it is the product of having every, it's not the product of having everything I ever wanted. It is the product of a gift of God. It is God's grace. That's the peace that he's speaking about. It's God's peace. It's unexplainable. It's the peace we see in the story of H.G. Spafford, Horatio Spafford. You remember his story? He was a businessman in Chicago and he was a dedicated Christian. He had some serious financial reversals, and during a time of readjustment, he lost his home. He realized that his family needed to get away for a vacation to kind of go away and regroup, as it were. And so Spafford decided to take the entire family to England. He sent his wife and four daughters ahead in the SS Villa du Havre, right? In the mid-ocean, the French steamer carrying his loved ones collided with another and sank within 12 minutes. 230 people lost their lives on that day. The four daughters were drowned, but Mrs. Spafford was rescued and she wired her husband the simple words, saved alone. Mr. Spafford was almost overcome with grief and he had lost all of his property. His four precious daughters were buried beneath the dark waves of the sea and his wife was prostrate with grief on the other side of the world but he put all of his trust in God and he wrote a song that was comforted thousands since when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul. That's God's peace. Not a peace that is the result of everything being in order, but a peace that is unexplainable, undefinable by worldly standards. This peace, God says, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. The term guard there in the Greek is teraho, and it means to speak of a military army legion. In other words, he's saying that it is though God's peace 
were a legion around your heart and your mind to guard you. That word guard, it also speaks of two separate things. When you guard something, you are not letting anything out, right? What is inside of us is joy. That was earlier in the message. The peace of God guards my joy. It guards my my sense of peace and, and tranquility. It guards the joy that I have in the work of Christ. What is my joy? It is Christ Jesus. So he's speaking about how the Holy Spirit has an ability to guard my faith in Christ. Even in the midst of a terrible tribulation, even in the midst of a terrible trial, God's peace, God's joy, God's peace guards my mind and my heart, guards my faith in Christ Jesus from escaping. Second of all, a guard also doesn't let anybody else in. Those things which could destroy my faith, those things that would take my joy, those things which would disrupt my peace, those things, the peace of Christ, Paul writes, guards against them. It keeps them out. It pushes them away. It defers them unto something else. Most importantly, he writes that he guards these things, listen, in Christ Jesus. The strong man at the door of my heart and mind this morning is the work of Jesus Christ. It's supremacy and efficacy on my behalf. What Jesus did on the cross is good enough to guard my mind and my heart this morning. No matter how difficult the day is, no matter how difficult the trial may be, God's peace, God's peace that he gives guards my mind and my heart and I can look to the finished work of Jesus Christ on my behalf and still have peace. Let, 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 me, let me illustrate this very, very personally this morning. Miss Kelly is 17 weeks pregnant. Four weeks ago, I was preparing for a ministry call when we woke up to blood. I don't want to be vulgar this morning in any way. But we knew what that meant. In that moment, I have no source of joy. I have no source of peace. Except that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for my sin. And my life rests fully in Him. And He will guard my heart and my mind. So in that moment, all we could do was pray. All we could do was trust in Christ Jesus. And you know what happened? God gave us peace. We went to a doctor and the doctor said, I don't know, but everybody's good today. We went back again and he said, I don't know, but everybody's good today. We went back a third time and he said, I don't know. It should have ended in a miscarriage. But God gave peace in the midst of the storm. We didn't have peace when we went and did an ultrasound. We had peace when we trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Peace, he says, will guard our heart and mind. Most importantly, he guards those things in Christ Jesus. Christ is the strong man. Today I can have peace in the storm, not because the storm's path will get out of the way. Will get me out of the way. I have peace as a result of the confidence I have in Christ Jesus. Because Christ died, I live. Because Christ faced the wrath of God upon sin, I won't. Because Christ assumed the lowly human condition, I am redeemed. Because Christ suffered and was exalted, so shall I be. All of my hope, all of my ambitions, all of my reasonableness, all of those things are a response to suffering rooted in the work of Jesus Christ on my behalf. Because Christ suffered and was exalted, so shall I be. I will model him. Thus Paul says, I want to know not only Christ, but the power of his suffering, the power of his death, and the power of his resurrection. As Christ was humiliated and then exalted, so shall I be. And he says to the Philippians, have this mind about yourselves. 
have this mind amongst yourselves. Be reasonable. Be calm. Be thoughtful. Let your petitions be known to God because God gives you a peace that the world cannot understand. And Jesus Christ will be the strong man at the door. His work, his effectual work on your behalf will calm your soul, calm your spirit, calm your mind, let you be reasonable in the midst of the storm. God gives us a peace that only he can give. I had, as I mentioned earlier, really hoped that we could get to verses 8 and 9 this morning. But I'll just stop here, conclude with a couple of truths. Before we close, we cannot divorce the words uh, that we've read to this point from the context. In verses 2 and 3, Paul writes, I entreat you, Odie, and I entreat Sintaichi to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Before Paul wrote about peace, before he wrote about the peace that God gives in trial, before he wrote about reasonableness and being calm and thoughtful and, 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 and reasonable in the midst of mankind, before he did any of those things, Paul's first admonition was that there was two people in the church who were, who were fighting with one another, whose bodies were not responding to the trial in the way they were supposed to. Now, I joked around with my men's group. No, I didn't. One of the other men joked around in our men's group uh, on Tuesday that it ought not surprise anybody that it was two ladies, right? Now, I didn't agree with them, but I'm just pointing out that it's two women who are at war, Right? We don't even know what they were fighting about. But Paul says, you need to come into agreement in the Lord. Now, it's not hard to imagine why they were fighting. The tension in Philippi, in the midst of the persecution and the apostles' imprisonment, must have been palpable. It must have been great, right? And in the midst of that tension, you know what happens? People's emotions begin to fray. They begin to get a little worn out. Their tempers get tested. Their self-control begins to get wasted. In the midst of the trial, Paul writes about two who failed to govern their bodies rightly. And they allowed the trial, the persecution, to begin to bleed over into the community. And it was testing their resolve as a church, as a local congregation. Let me make it simpler than that. Oftentimes... Your personal struggles, my personal struggles become struggles for the community of Christ if we do not put our bodies into the care of Christ Jesus. If we do not stop in that moment and seek him, seek his peace, seek his governance, what happens is my personal trial begins to bleed over into what's going on in the community. That's what happened with these two, two women. And so the apostles' admonition to them was, to stop in that moment and agree in the Lord Jesus Christ. His admonition not only to them and now to us, then would be this, submit ourselves to the care of Jesus Christ and to live peaceably in the midst of the storms of life. We are to seek our answers from heaven and not from man. God will give us a peace in the trial. I don't know what you may be going through this morning, but I would encourage you to draw your joy from the right well. Christ Jesus this morning is the only source for your joy. There's nothing in life which shall satisfy, but in faith in Christ, he says in this moment we can find a peace that the world cannot explain. You cannot control your circumstances this morning. You cannot control what will happen when we leave this place. What you can control is your response. And so he said of the body, be reasonable and petition the Lord, knowing that he's right here with us. Beloved, I'm thankful for the peace that God gives in the storms of life that the world cannot comprehend. My only admonition is I want you to have that peace this morning, and you can only have it when you draw from the right well, the well of Jesus Christ. Stand with me reverently and let's pray.